All right, we're going to do uh, a little thing about Jim Morrison right now. <clears throat> I've been reading from this book, Simply A Course in Miracles. Um, it's on Amazon by Alao Alani. I've also actually done some other books. If you look up Alao Alani on, on Amazon, you'll see a bunch of books. Um, one book I published was about Jim Morrison, actually. I did a, I did a paper in graduate school about Jim. Um, and what I did in that paper was I was looking at <clears throat> Jim Morrison in the making of a myth and how he, <clears throat> he, he, he kind of made his own myth about himself, <clears throat> kind of like promulgated this, this myth to some extent. Um, but it also, be, it also grew after his death. And I, he's still um, going strong to this day. You know, um, you got you got Jim Morrison and and and, and the other members of the Twenty Seven Club. You know, um, especially Jimi Hendrix, Janis Joplin, and obviously they were great artists. They 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 had a very big impact in a very short time. Obviously, they all started in their, um, you know. For example, Hendrix, really Jim Morrison and Hendrix were, were the same time, you know, the exact same time period. <clears throat> Probably Janis too. I, have, I don't know as much about Janis Joplin. I do know that, that Janis and Jimmy um, didn't like Jim that much, <laughs> apparently. Um, they were all part of the 27 Club. They, they all died in a nine-month period. All three of them died in, in a nine-month period. <clears throat> between um, 70 and 71, um, Jim, was the, Jim was the last to go, Jim Morrison. Um, now, Jim Morrison might have been the, the most intellectual in a way. He was also a mystic. Um, he was definitely, he had the gift of gab. He was able to, he... he he was a very good speaker, which is belied by the image of him as a rock star, as the as the um, the boorish, drunken rock star. You know, and if you watch, for example, Oliver Stone's movie, The Doors movie, Val Kilmer, in a sense, plays Jim Morrison really well. But but you get this, you get you you. I don't know if you really get the true Jim there. <laughs> in fact, I would say you don't really. Um, there's a book about Jim Morrison w that I th thought really got the closest to, to to the true Jim Morrison, and that that book is called Wild Child. The thing about that book is it's probably all made up, <laughs> but it's a very cool book. Uh, I forget the author the author's name now, but um, I think she really got close to to like the the, the true essence of Jim Morrison. Um, and in, in my book, in the, the Simply A Course in Miracles book, I did not include Jim Morrison. I included John Lennon, but I did not include Jim Morrison. I might have included quotes from Jim, maybe Jimi Hendrix and, and Janis Joplin. I could, have I could have included some quotes from all of them, uh, but I didn't. So here I'm going to do a little correction and I'm going to do some Jim Morrison quotes. Um, I think his best quotes actually might be the, the stuff that's actually in his lyrics in his, in his song lyrics and his poetry. Um, some of the song lyric, song lyrics we all know. I'm going to mention a few of them. Um, one of them is, uh, from his, from the first album, the first, the Doors album was a great debut album. I, can't, I think it came out in 66. Um, time to live, time to die. Did I time to live, time to lie, or maybe time to die, time to laugh and time to die? Yeah, time to live, time to lie, time to laugh and time to die. Take it easy, baby. Take it as it comes. That was from from the first album. I really like that song actually. Take it as it comes. Um, it's 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 very ecclesiastical in the sense of like it's it's kind of echoing Ecclesiastes. That uh, there's a season, there's a time and season for everything, and we don't need to get so uptight, right? We don't need to be uptight about everything. We don't need to, we don't need to, you know, 
fight all the evils of the world because there is a time and place for everything in a sense um not that we don't need to sometimes do that but 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 it's it's like how we do it that that might be key and if we can do it from a place of love and forgiveness versus anger and and attack and judgment i think we're we're going to go further um so some of the things that we know, uh, the Doors had a song, uh, five to one, five to one, one and five, no one here gets out alive. That's a great quote, no one here gets out alive because um, <laughs> we, we keep putting out the hope and some of us still, you know, alive right now in the body, in this world, might be having the hope that um, somehow we're gonna attain immortality and we're never gonna die. Now, you know, the truth is, is that the mortality rate is still 100%, right? It has not changed. No one here gets out alive. Knowing that, I think, is crucial. And, 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 and maybe having that, you know, that, re, that remembrance, it's called memento mori in, in, in Latin. There's a, a Latin term, memento mori, is, is the, that constant remembrance that you are mortal and that you will die, um, I think is is crucial. And, and you can see that idea all throughout Jim Morrison's body of work, including uh, from the first album. Uh, the, the, the most important one is the end. This is the end, right? He's, he starts his whole career with this great song, which is all about, in a sense, is about death. Um, and you can see it all throughout. Um, the next album, the next Doors album, you have the, the, another epic long song called the, when the music's over. And there he also says, um, when the music's over, turn on the light, turn off the light, turn out the light because the music is your special friend. Dance on fire as it intends. Music is your only friend until the end. Um, there's the end again. And the end, if you look at his lyrics, the end keeps showing up and death definitely keeps showing up throughout. Um, the future's uncertain, but the end is always near. That's another one from uh, Roadhouse Blues, right? Um, the, uh, the Morrison Hotel album. That was, I think the second to last album. That was actually, critically, that was one of their better albums. Um, the future is uncertain, but the end is always near. No eternal reward will forgive us now for wasting the dawn. That was from um, Texas Radio and the Big Beat. The Wasp, it's called. W-A-S-P. No eternal reward will forgive us now for wasting the dawn. And that maybe we could talk a little bit about A Course in Miracles in that quote. Um... Life, you know, heaven is here, heaven is now, as the Course tells us. The light of dawn, the dawn, the dawn's awakening is right here and now. Um, we do not have to push it, push it to later and say, well, when I go to heaven, everything's going to be rosy, you know, and, and now I have to suffer. <laughs> um, but rather, we can we can get there all, all along. You know, we can be going to heaven all along the way, right? And we can even experience heaven right here on earth. Maybe not everyone at the same time, but we can have that experience ourselves. And you know, we could t talk about each one of these a lot, but but uh, I'm gonna move on. Here's, a, here's an actual quote from something he said, from Morris, what Morrison said in an interview. We talked about William Blake. In my last video, I talked about William Blake and the Doors of Perception. That's where the Doors got their name. The, Jim Morrison chose that name based on, on Aldous Huxley's book, The Doors of Perception, which ultimately goes back to the William Blake quote, quote which is, uh, if the Doors of Perception were cleansed, things would appear as they truly are infinite. I might have not gotten that completely right, but it was that's pretty close. 
So here's what Jim said in one place. He said, Blake said that the body was the soul's prison unless the five senses are fully developed and open. He considered the senses, quote, the, the windows of the soul. When sex involves all the senses intensely, it can be a, like a mystical experience. Um, now, did William Blake really say that? Is that what, what, what his intention was? I'm not sure, actually. I think what Blake might have been getting at more is not to fully develop and open the senses. I think um, it, it is to go beyond the senses, actually. And, and you find that like in the, in the yoga scriptures and the mystical writings, um, but a lot in the yoga scriptures, going back to the Bhagavad Gita and maybe even earlier, the Upanishads talk about um, going beyond the senses, right? Going beyond the, um, the, 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 the sensory inputs and, the, and the, the sense witnessing to the reality of this world you go beyond the senses and you and you go beyond the illusion of uh, what the Hindus call Maya. Now, but you can also really go into the senses too. You could say this maybe that's more of a tantric thing, and then you can you can really, in a sense, transcend the senses through the senses themselves. And that that's. That idea of uh, the only way out is through. You probably heard that, right? The only way out is through. So maybe the way the way out, in a sense, is through the senses, as opposed to to just trying to transcend the senses completely. But you actually go into the senses and you fully experience the senses, and maybe experience all that the senses have to offer, and then you can transcend them. Um, so th that's a great one, you know. And I don't want to. I don't want to like put down what Jim Morrison was saying, but it, he might have been saying something a little different than what William Blake intended. I could be wrong about that. Here's another quote from Jim. Expose yourself to your deepest fear. After that, fear has no power and the fear of freedom shrinks and vanishes. You are free. It's a great one. And this is, you know, I would say this is like spot on with The Course in Miracles. This is like exactly what A Course in Miracles is getting at, which is you go into the fear. You, you go to where your deepest fear is, your mother wound, and you, and you confront it head on. You step right into the fire, right? Light my fire, <laughs> right? And you, and you, when you do that, you realize that death has no power. Fear is nothing. And you go beyond it. So I'll read it one more time. Expose yourself to your deepest fear. After that, fear has no power and the fear of freedom shrinks and vanishes. You are free. If my poetry aims to achieve anything, it's to deliver people from the limited ways in which they see and feel. If my poetry aims to achieve anything, is to deliver people from the limited ways in which they see and feel. It's a great, great sentiment. Jim Morrison was just awesome. You know, I don't, I don't care what Jimmy and Janice thought about him. He, he was just a, a brilliant, you know, he, he was up there with the great, great thinkers and mystics that we've been talking about, as far as I'm concerned. I read the, the No One Here Gets Out Alive book. Um, do I have, I don't have it right here. No one here gets out alive. Um, Danny Sugarman, who was a, a young kid, basically, um, uh, that was working for The Doors. And then he wrote this really cool book that came out in 1981. And it kind of put Jim Morrison back in, 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 in the consciousness of the world. And I picked it up. I was 11 years old. And I was entranced. And I read that book at least three or four times over the years. And then I ended up doing this whole long paper about Jim Morrison in graduate school, where I, I looked at as many books as were available in the, this is like the mid nineties. I looked at as many books as were available, uh, films. And I did this whole paper about the myth of Jim Morrison, basically, and how, how human beings can become a myth. And it's called, um, you you hemorization is the term it works both ways it's sometimes 
where there it's not actually a person that ever lived. Um, they're a myth, and then they get made into a human being. They 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 are written into history, so to speak. And 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 if you if you've been following at all the the debates about Christianity, there's the there's the historicist position and there's the mythicist position. The mythicist position uh, that is um, being really championed by the championed by this guy, Dr. Richard Carrier, is basically that Jesus was a myth initially, and then then later, starting with the gospel accounts, he was written into history basically, as a way to to get people to fo to follow the religion because because if you have a, a real historical figure people are more likely to follow because and they have something to hold on to and humor you hammerization can work the other way too like with jim morrison is um he was a man he was just a regular dude <laughs> genius you know very high iq person very sensitive individual God knows where he came from, but but um, he was a man. He was a human being, and myths grew up around him. Like he was a legend. He was the Lizard King, right? He be he became a living legend, and even beyond that now. Um, that's why that that movie was so powerful and, and and touched a lot of people. The Doors movie, you know, that I was mentioning is because Jim Morrison really was a very interesting character and he really played it to the hilt. You know, he played, he, he milked it for all he could. And he, he, he was very purposeful in his, in his eccentrism and his um, doing crazy things in order to um, light people's fire. <laughs> so, Another thing about his poetry, listen, he, he said, listen, real poetry doesn't say anything. It just ticks off the possibilities, opens all doors. You can walk through anyone that suits you. Remember that Emily Dickinson line, I dwell in possibility. So it just ticks off, real poetry just ticks off the possibilities, it opens all doors. And, and Emily Dickinson also said something about because um, I don't know when, um, let me see what she wrote. She said, not knowing when the dawn will come, I open every door. Not knowing when the dawn will come, I open every door. Speaking of doors, <laughs> there are things known and things unknown and in between are the doors. So Jim definitely saw himself and the doors as a doorway or a portal to, to a world beyond our senses, right? Other dimensions of reality, maybe purer and truer dimensions that, that we cannot f fathom from where we are right now in this 3D mundane universe that we seem to inhabit on a daily basis. The most important kind of freedom is to be what you really are. You trade in your reality for a role. You give up your ability to feel and in exchange put on a mask. And that's basically the world. It's still the world to some extent, to some large extent. <clears throat> you, have a, you have a full spectrum of people. You have a full, this is on a continuum. You have people that have b been able to drop the mask and, and, and be who, who they really are, what they really are. And on the other, you know, and I would say that it runs the gamut and you find people who are, are um, you know, maybe stuck in, in roles that they're playing and they're not even fully aware that they're playing a role or that they're stuck in a way of seeing and being that is limiting. And the Course in Miracles and, and, and the poetry that we're talking about, the music and the, and, and the artistry is all there in many ways to help free you. Right, Jesus, uh, not Jesus, uh, Jim said, uh, I'm sure that Jim thought, you know, saw himself as a messianic figure, uh, as I believe Jimi Hendrix did as well. Um, 
so I, you know, I, I wasn't incorrect to say Jesus, but, but Jim, um, he, you know, he said, I'm the freedom man. I'm the freedom man. So the most important kind of freedom is to be what you really are. Right, to be what you really are. Um, let's see where, let's see what else I have here. I have a, a couple more to share. How can I set free, and this is maybe one of the most important ones right here. How can I set free anyone who doesn't have the guts to stand up alone and declare his own freedom? I think it's a lie. People claim they want to be free. Everyone insists that freedom is what they want the most, the most sacred and precious thing a man can possess. But that's bullshit. People are terrified to be set free. They hold on to their chains. This is uh, Echoes of, Pla of Plato, the cave allegory. They fight anyone who tries to break those chains. It's their security. How can they expect me or anyone else to set them free if they don't really want to be free? So this is... This is, again, spot on with the Course and, and with Plato and with the, uh, the cave allegory. You know, a prisoner, they're prisoners in the cave watching shadows on the wall from the light, from the fire behind them. One of the prisoner manages to get, get, get free. He goes out in the sunlight, sees the sun, and goes back into the cave to, to tell the other prisoners that are still bound what he has seen and that he has seen something so beautiful and so true and he wants to set them free and they 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 don't want to believe him and they even want to kill him so jim is saying you know people give lip service to this idea of freedom but in reality how much do they really want to be free because it's very because freedom is scary you could say, you know, when you go through all your fear, then you're free. There's a lot of similarity between the two words. They're, they're both four-letter words. <laughs> they both begin with F. Um, you, go, you go through all of your fear, and you get yourself free. Not until you face your deepest fear, like Jim said in that other quote. When you face your deepest fear, your deepest fears, then you, you will be truly free. But who wants to face their deepest fears? Not many people, because they're afraid to. And that's okay. That's okay. You know, I think Jim may, may be a little bit too intense here in what he's saying. You know, like Jesus in the Course would be a little bit more gentle and say, yes, I understand. You know, I, you're afraid. I understand. You don't want to listen to what I'm saying. I understand. I completely understand. I have infinite patience. I wouldn't say that that's bullshit. That's, that's just where you're at at this moment. And I'm just telling you that you can be free. <laughs> If you want to be, and you can, you can, you can know what I know if you want to, but, but take your time, take your time. I'm not pushing you. I'm not forcing you. Love does not coerce, does not force, does not impose, does not convert. All right. Let's read another similar one. It's a very similar one. People are afraid of themselves, of their own reality, their feelings most of all. People talk about how great love is, but that's bullshit. Love hurts. Feelings are disturbing. People are taught that pain is evil and dangerous. How can they deal with love if they're afraid to feel? Pain is meant to wake us up. People try to hide their pain, but they're wrong. Pain is something to carry like a radio. You feel your strength in the experience of pain. It's all in how you carry it. Again, he calls it bullshit, right? People talk about how great love is, just about like the, how they talk about how great freedom is. Um, love hurts, feelings are just... Now, J Jim himself was in a committed relationship with Pamela Corson, but they, apparently, they fought all the time, and, and she really was a big nag, <laughs> apparently. And, uh, and, and I'm not sure if he knew how to deal with it completely. Um... And I think many people in relationships deal with that kind of stuff again and again. Um, now, what I would say is, again, I wouldn't be this intense about it. Um, well, there's sometimes there's a place for his intensity here. But I would say, 
in order to get to the love, you got to go through the hate. To get to heaven, you got to go through hell. You have to see um, how you are responsible. If other people are not happy around you, you have to see that, that you are partly responsible for their not being happy. On the other hand, you cannot make people happy or sad either. They have to choose that. But at least you don't want to, you want to see them as healed and whole and not judge them if you can if you can help it um and i think the other thing is is that true love is is a rare commodity in this world <laughs> it's not a commodity but but it's a rare thing who really can experience true love many people do but it's not, it does not tend to last the whole lifetime. Um, and I would say that the, the true love, the love that we're talking about is really not of this world. And I think that's where people get off track is because they're looking for that love and they're not necessarily gonna find it here. They're not gonna find the love that truly lasts. That love is what, what the Course says is in the world, the realm of knowledge, which is God's realm. That is when you return home to God, to the love of God, and then you then then you're there. But otherwise, you're gonna be you're gonna be in the world of ambival ambivalence. Sometimes feeling the love, sometimes not feeling the love, sometimes um, judging others for not giving you the love that you believe that you deserve, and other times, most of the time, you're judging yourself and judging yourself as unworthy of love. Here's another one. Here's another quote from Jim. I think this gets a little bit closer to it. This is what real, real love amounts to, letting a person be what he really is. Most people love you for who you pretend to be. To keep their love, you keep pretending, performing. You get to love your pretense. It's true. We're locked in an image, an act. And the sad thing is people get so used to their image, they grow attached to their masks. They love their chains. They forget all about who they really are. And if you try to remind them, they hate you for it. They feel like you're trying to steal their most precious possession. Now, this is true of Jim, that he got locked into this image of himself as a rock star. And then he tried to, he tried to change his image by, by publishing his poetry to show people that he wasn't just this loud, obnoxious rock star, but he was a very deep and sensitive thinker. He had a lot to offer in that regard. Um, he, he also, uh, you know, had the soul of a, a poet. <laughs> he also said he had the soul of a clown, but, um, he, and he, um, he didn't want to be locked into that. And, and I, and you could see maybe his, his decline as, as a conscious decision on his part that he did not want to stay stuck where he was on some level. He also enjoyed it for sure. He must have. Right. But but on another level, um, he saw it as a dead end and, and stultifying in terms of of really just wanting to be himself and wanting to help others be themselves as well. He was just a really cool dude. <laughs> and I've spent about almost 30 minutes now talking about him. He was, you know, I would say he was my first guru in this lifetime because uh, I just I had just hit puberty at 11 and I started reading that book. And I also started reading this book about Jimi Hendrix, Excuse Me While I Kiss the Sky. Both books were, were, uh, were catalysts for me at that point, but more the No One Here Gets Out Alive book. I would recommend it if you've never read that book. It's, uh, it's, it's not really factual though. <laughs> it, it has a lot of good, good stuff, but it's, um, it's short on the truth actually, unfortunately. And there are better books that have come out since, but it was one of the first of its kind. And it, it's overall, it's a good book. You know, it's just don't look at that as the final word on Jim Morrison either. Don't look at the Oliver Stone movie as the final word on Jim Morrison. Really, to understand anything, you have to go searching. You have to you have to look for it. Um, and uh, you know, you really have to to know Jim is to love Jim. That's all I would say. You have to really look and you have to be open to seeing him for who he, what he really was, who he really was. And um, anyway, that's
that's all for now. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in. We'd love to hear your comments. See you soon. Bye-bye.